A few billion years ago, there was a big hungry cell and a little cell. And the big hungry cell surrounded and engulfed the little cell. But the little cell was able to survive and thrive inside of the big cell. And the big cell was able to survive and thrive with the little cell inside of it. Both evolved and came to depend on each other. And that is the story of endosymbiosis. It has happened many times on Earth. Endosymbiosis and the origin of eukaryotic cells. Now, how did life generate diversity? Well, you'll learn in high school that, well, there's divergence and you have genetic mutations, and basically there's a picture that looks like this. You come along, you have mutation, and then the two things go separately, and so you've generated novelty by separating two, uh, separating one species. Now, but you also can have convergence, and that's when you combine existing life forms, and the little diagram looks like this, where here's one life form, here's another life form, and they come together to form a new life form. And notice it doesn't take any time to mutate and diverge, but rather it's almost immediate when they come together and they start living together. Now you can't talk about endosymbiosis without thinking about Lynn Margulis. Lynn Margulis was a great scientist. Here she is getting the National Medal of Science in 1999. Here she is walking around a bacterial mat in Mexico. And here she is getting married in 1957 to Carl Sagan, of astro an astrobiologist. Now, here she is with her son, Dorian, and they've written quite a few books together. One is Acquiring Genomes and the Garden of Microbial Delights, Microcosmos. Here are a few other, other books, What is Sex and The Origins of Sex. They've written that together. They've written What is Life. And here's a, a book called Symbiotic Planet. And Lynn also wrote this book, Kingdoms and Domains, because she loves single-celled eukaryotes, and that's the book mostly about it. Now, I went to visit her a few months before she died, and we talked all things eukaryotic and the origins of life and what is life and what is sex, and she showed me all kinds of things. And uh, she also showed me the house of where Emily Dickinson, a famous American poet, lived, and her house was right next to it. I think she bought this house be, to be close to Emily Dickinson. You can see that their hairstyle was a little bit similar uh, about 50 years ago. And Emily Dickinson wrote this poem that inspired Lynn quite a bit. And here's the poem. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. And Lynn was so inspired by this. She also memorized almost all this woman's poems. Uh, that she wrote a book based on this line, tell, tell all the truth but tell it slant, and here's a book, Slanted Truths, essays on Gaia, symbiosis, and evolution. And at the end of the poem here it says, the truth must dazzle gradually, and that's the name of another book, Dazzle Gradually, Reflections on the Nature of Nature. Now, after she died, Dorian, her son, put together this uh, book of essays about her life, and here's a quote from Lynn that kind of is, is quite characteristic. I don't consider my ideas controversial. I consider them right. And here's a quote from Emily, that it will never come again is what makes life so sweet. Now, this is her, probably her most famous groundbreaking, groundbreaking paper in 1967 on the origin of mitosing cells or on the origin of eukaryotic cells. And here in the, this was, well, here in the abstract it says, Three fundamental organelles, the mitochondria, the photosynthetic plastids, and the nine plus two basal bodies of flagella were themselves once free-living prokaryotic cells. At the time, people thought they were, this was a crazy idea. How could these organelles once have been free-living? And this paper was rejected 15 times because of the conservative nature of the biological organizations. Now. Let's have a look at what she was talking about. On the left is a prokaryote. It's very small. A eukaryotic cell in the center is very big. And eukaryotes, the main feature of eukaryotes is that they have a nuclear membrane in blue here. But that's not what uh, Lynn was talking about. She was talking about these mitochondria 
and this plastid or chloroplast and the red basal body and the underlipodium at the bottom. And we were talk she was concerned about the origin of these structures. She thought that the mitochondria came from a free-living bacteria in the alpha proteobacteria family, that the plastid had come from cyanobacteria, and maybe the flagella or the underlipodium was a free-living spirochete before it started pushing things around. Now, if you draw this on a tree of life, then you have the eukaryotes in the middle, and you see these arrow, that's where mitochondria went over and joined and, and at the base of eukaryotes, and then into plants had the chloroplasts became endosymbiotically incorporated into plants. Now, this is a rather simplified version of the tree of life, and Doolittle, 1999, wrote this one, but then he said, you know what, maybe there have been so many divergences and so many convergences and endosymbiotic events that maybe the tree looks like this network instead of the simpler one up on top. And this view is becoming more and more prevalent as we find out more and more about the origin of life on Earth, which is important if we're trying to find out about the origin of life elsewhere. Now, let's talk a little bit about the details of Lynn Margulis' endosymbiotic theory. First of all, you get a nucleus and then you have the endoplasmic reticulum, which is in blue, and its membrane is part of the membrane of the nucleus. And then along comes the first endosymbiotic event in which you have an aerobic bacterium, something like an alpha proteobacterium, getting engulfed, as you can see in the picture, and then it gets completely engulfed and then you become a modern heterotrophic eukaryote with mitochondrions, mitochondria inside, and that's what our cells are look like. But then there's a second endosymbiotic event, if you're interested in plants, and there you have a photosynthetic bacterium getting engulfed. When it gets completely engulfed, you call it a modern photosynthetic eukaryote, where you can notice that it has mitochondria and chloroplasts inside of it. Not like us, we don't have chloroplasts. Now, so here's on the, on the left we have primary endosymbiosis, in which first you have a mitochondrion being engulfed, and then you have three separate engulfments of photosynthetic uh, bacteria. And on the bottom, you produce chlorophyta, and that becomes a land plant. In the middle, you have uh, red algae, and then on the top, you have glycophyta. So those are presumably three separate uh, endosymbiotic events. Now, there's also a secondary endosymbiosis. This is kind of weird. It's a little like a Russian doll in the sense that the red algae got engulfed by another uh, life form and got completely incorporated so you have an organelle inside of a, a cell in which is inside of a cell. And that happened not just once but twice when you produced the chlorophyta, got engulfed and then you turned into a chlorarachneophyta. And uh, this is kind of complicated and it's really weird but that's what happened at multiple times. And if we want to understand how, let's put this into context in a phylogenetic tree, the phylogenetic tree on the right is something we've seen before, and let's just locate where these names are on this tree. So here are the land plants, the green plants. Here are the rhodophyta, or the red algae. Here are the glycophyta. You notice they're close, they're all in the same green group there. But then you have the cryptophyta, and then you have also the chlorarachneophyta, pretty separate from them. And that's where these things are in the phylogenetic tree. Now, let's talk about this paper, and particularly let's talk about not the mitochondria and not the plastids, but let's talk about this basal bodies, because this is something that's still controversial. Lynn insisted that it was the case, but not the, the majority of biologists probably disagree. I, I agree with Lynn, so let's look at what she was talking about. So here's the cell, the prokaryote and then the eukaryote. Look at the red thing in the bottom. At the base of this underlipodium is a basal body. And if we look at a cross section of it, here's the, the green is the underlipodium, and the basal body is at the bottom, and the cross section is in the lower left, and you can see that there are nine triplets. And if you do the cross section of the underlipodium up higher, then you see nine plus two. So there's nine plus two in the uh, flagella, and there's nine plus zero in the basal body, and the zero refers to nothing in the middle. And uh, here's a cross-section of a sperm. If you make sperm, this is what a cross-section of the sperm's tail looks like. Notice it has this nine plus two structure. 
And if you're looking at uh, green algae and you cut it through, you'll see a, also the 9 plus 2 structure and telling you that your sperm and uh, single-celled green algae are have, a have a common origin, probably. It, the independent origin of a 9 plus 2 structure seems rather unlikely to me and, and originally to Lynn. If you look at a centriole, and this is a little bit interesting, kind of complicated. Now this is a centriole. Centrioles are things associated with cells when they mitose and they divide. And this is a centriole of an embryonic mouse brain. And if you look carefully, you can see that it has this 9 plus 0 structure, much like the basal body. So the idea is that the apparatus that is responsible for dividing or mitosing is closely related and has its origin in the basal bodies of flagellum or underlipodium, which is, that's Lynn's idea. It's not accepted yet. It's quite controversial. I think it's obvious that she's right, but who am I? Now, here's a phylogenetic tree, and you can see that the eukaryotes in the middle are kind of, they have this extra length to their diversity. And maybe it's the case that this extra length has been produced by the combinatorics of these bacteria getting together and engulfing each other. And uh, that's what this says. Maybe the extra length added to all eukaryotic lines could be a, some kind of Cambrian explosion caused by the endosymbiosis, the combinatorics of endosymbiosis. And just as a last leaving you with mixatrixa paradoxa, if you're interested in all of the wonderful ways in which life on Earth is the result of endosymbiosis, you can do no worse, no better than looking at mixatrixa paradoxa. It's inside of a gut of a termite and read Lynn Margulis's Symbiotic Planet. So the idea that we've looked at here is that endosymbiosis has been an important way in which life on Earth has produced novelty, and because it's important on Earth, maybe it's important also on other Earths elsewhere in the universe. <laughs>